Hi, and welcome to Access Chat. We're really pleased to welcome back Rob Price and Christopher Joinson. Um, we featured Rob and Christopher just before Christmas when they were anticipating getting the results in of their Digital Society survey. Uh, those results are in now. They've done some analysis and are back to talk with us about some of the findings. So what 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 was the thing that really um, surprised you most about the uh, the results in the survey? I, I've, I've seen some of it, but what were the things that really um, startled you? Um, so yeah, I, I, I forgot Did I kick to off? Yeah, I f yeah, I kind of forgot to mention that that uh, your colleagues of mine and your members of the scientific community, for people that haven't joined us before, I'm very bad at this. I always assume that everyone knows everyone else. So, um, so, so Rob Price, CEO of Worldline, Christopher Joinson, uh, uh, consultant for for Atos um, around digital transformation, both members of scientific community. Rob, albeit emeritus. I believe now. Indeed, indeed. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, uh, do, do you know, I think the honest answer is I'm astonished that so many people responded is, is the first thing. I mean, to, to actually, uh, I think by the end, we'd got um, over 1500 responses from 63 different countries. 63 countries was just astonishing. Um, and OK, clearly, kind of some of the countries were far more responses than, than others. We got an excellent response from the UK, from India, uh, from the US, Germany, Netherlands. Um, so, so really kind of strong. What was interesting is that we had a lot of responses from the Far East as well. So Singapore, Thailand, China, um, Philippines, um, Africa, kind of a number of countries kind of. From the, so I think what was great is... Um, we got lots of people who were interested in engaging and giving their views. Um, it's probably fair to say that it's an online survey, so it's naturally going to get uh, people responding who are comfortable in the first place with online services, uh, rather than those who are um, not currently engaging kind of through mobile or, 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 or web or computer or whatever. Um, but, but that's the first thing. It was just an astonishing response. Christopher, how about for you? Yeah, um, just to add to that, um, we had um, across all of the responses, people spent 260 hours worth of time completing our survey, which is, which is phenomenal. And I, th I think there were some things that we're, we're expecting to see and, and some things that surprised us a bit. And um, I think it's understandable that they surprised us. We were expecting to understand people's gut instinct about technology, that thing that drives them to adopt technology because they feel comfortable with it or to resist technology because they feel um, uncomfortable with it. Um, and uh, across all the survey responses, we grouped people into whether they were enthralled with technology and were more likely to love it. People who were enticed by, by technology but might not necessarily be earlier adopters. People who were reluctant to embrace technology but um, were, were cautiously involved in it and um, people who were outright resistant to it. And um, the, the split was fascinating. We had 24% of people who were enthralled 46% of people who were enticed, 24% who were reluctant, and 6% 6, 6 who were outright resistant, which is an exactly 70-30% split between what we refer to as the digital divide, that difference between being comfortable and being uncomfortable. Um, and to be able to see that on paper and see that across the whole of our world um, it w was fascinating. I, th I think, I mean, you asked kind of what surprised us, um, Neil. So, so there are some things that didn't surprise us. Um, uh, most uh, questions that we asked, and I think there were 43 questions that we asked, on most of those questions you saw a clear um, difference in, in age, for example, when we looked at kind of the... Uh, how people felt about these technologies based on based on their age group. Uh, the, uh, most questions, uh, unsurprisingly, those who were in the over 60 group uh, were less comfortable about the digital technology or service than those under 29, for example. Um, but what was interesting was 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 the information that gave insight as to where that wasn't the case. Um, so if I can pick a couple of those. Um, 
I think there are three groupings of questions where age wasn't really a difference in how people felt about those technologies. So the, the first one is where there is a clear benefit, personal benefit of time um, and, and sufficient trust. So, so a good example there was contactless payment. Most people were quite comfortable with contactless payment. Um, the second grouping was where things clearly related to health benefit. So that had some unusual kind of uh, examples. At the, for example, um, nanobots in your bloodstream was one I think I talked about on the previous call, um, was, was perceived more comfortably than some of the other examples that are maybe kind of more common day to day technologies. Um, that was one that I actually felt uncomfortable with. So I'm going against trend there. And, and 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 I think I mean comes back to the point of there were lots of different opinions. Um, some people were were very um, un uncomfortable and and, and uh, horrified even by uh, it, and that came through in the figures. But overall, actually, the data suggested that people were more comfortable with that um, th than otherwise. Um, and and then the, the third grouping in terms of, um, uh, of, of where age was less relevant was, was products that are very familiar to us. So things like uh, watching on demand TV, reading a Kindle. It, it was pretty flat. Um, in fact, actually, I would say the Kindle that was the, that was the, the single thing, single question, where age had no difference whatsoever in terms of how people felt. Now, there is one other point to make from the data, which is the over, and, and again, maybe kind of that we expect, the over 60 age group, on the whole, there was a steeper incline difference between how comfortably they felt about whatever it was that we were talking about from the other age group. So if you like it, it kind of, as, as age increased, you had a slight incline and then over 60 kind of shot up. Again, not too surprising in the sense of, um, if you take my own example, I, I started playing with computers and technology when I was 13, um, and, and I'm kind of 50 now. So therefore, that age group may be kind of familiar, whereas 60 plus, th th commonly accessible um, technologies such as the, the computer in those early days of the 80s or mobiles just weren't around when they were being most informed. I have a, I have a question. Uh, I know uh, uh, we, when we talked about it last time, and I've also had the pleasure to talk to you and Christopher um, more about it, but will you will you take some time to talk about why ATOS is doing this? In the first place, thank you, ATOS, for doing this, because we really need this data. We need this data, and that I can tell nobody else has gathered it. But why is ATOS taking the time to bring in their scientific community to do this? I, I just think uh, other people might be wondering that as well. I, I think, Deborah, it, it, it's driven by a recognition from Atos and, and from Worldline, of course, as well, that um, our impacts as organizations as uh, rolling out technology to, to the masses um, has a, is a bigger impact um, than what it might have done in the past. Previously, we might have rolled out a, a thinner phone or a lighter laptop. Whereas now, the services we're rolling out, whether it's in government, maybe in the future bringing out online voting for government or um, artificially intelligent devices and all of these more, much more intrusive things, the stakes are much higher now than they used to be before. And I think it's really important that well, Atos has, um, is able to start that conversation about how organizations should um, manage themselves and roll out that technology in a sustainable way that works for the good of all of us as opposed to the good of the few i think what's been really interesting over the so it's so what a year and three months that we've been looking at this now is is just how much the rest of the world has started talking about the same subject as well so lots of large organizations lots of um very visible individuals have started questioning um what the appropriate way to uh, behave, to uh, act, to sustain not only kind of their own businesses, but society as a whole. Um, so, so, so I think it's great that Atos and Worldline are very much at the heart of that. I think, I think also one of the things that we've always asked is what's the evolution of 
CSR to encapsulate some of these the, these areas that we've been exploring over the last 15 months as well. And I think both Atos and Worldline um, have have had a really strong focus on that. Indeed, uh, from a selfish point of view, in terms of Worldline, um, it's 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 CSR kind of scores on really high. And and I think it's great to be able to add in another layer to that that really kind of then starts to think about um, how do we kind of get the best balance between not only introducing new technologies and services that can help some but actually help everybody and help society as a whole. And I think if certainly as a, as, as a payments business uh, from Worldline point of view, I mean, our, our role is very much geared to that shift of a cash to cashless society. And my word is society. So how do, I mean, that is a digital society. That's a key part of it. How do we ensure that um, consumers are able to kind of be part of that being involved in using services that we provide in a way that gives them confidence and, and accessibility and secure uh, and that they trust. And I have a real quick question to ask, and maybe I apologize, it's a hard question. So Christopher, I know you're geared up, but it, I, as you talk about CSR, corporate social responsibility, um, what we are finding, especially with the community of people with disabilities, is there seems to be a lot of smoke and mirrors with when you're talking about CSR, and there's a lot of groups, especially the disability community, that feels that corporations don't really care about CSR. So I would wonder if other, and I hope that's not true. I hope the, the brands that I work with, I think, really do care. But how can that, you know, belief that nobody, that the brands don't care at all about CSR. How does that, how can that tie into your work? And Christopher, I know you also wanted to comment on what um, Rob had said. Sure. Um, and I think it's a, like you say, it's a very difficult question to answer. I think it, it in that respect, it's just, it's not just the role of organizations to push this agenda. We're seeing um, fear of dystopian futures seep into the public domain as well, with um, TV shows like Black Mirror um, scaring the daylights out of people about what's possible if we do things in the wrong way. And we're also starting to see the government play a more proactive role in regulating um, technological change, whether that be the business models that uh, Uber are bringing about or uh, the way in which large organizations deal with people's data through GDPR. Uh, it, it needs to be a network of people engaging in this discussion. Um, I put an emphasis on the discussion there because um, this is such a subjective topic. Uh, what's right for me is, is is not necessarily right for someone else. And that's at the core of the survey that we produced. And um, I think it, we all should have a voice in this conversation. Yeah. OK, I, I think that, as Rob says, we we're in, entering a period where people's views of how businesses work and what their purpose is, is, is changing. If we look at even you know, senior venture capitalists now saying actually companies need a purpose. They need to um, be doing something that f uh, for society. That's quite a step change because let's face it, venture capitalism isn't really the first place you'd go to thinking about um, you know what it's going to contribute to social good. So the fact that these big fund managers and big venture capitalists are now actually saying actually. You know, we do need to do this. We need to be looking at, at 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 more than just shareholder value. We need to be looking at societal value. Is a I think a step change. I think that um, ethics does play a role. We we know we have an an ethics committee within our our own organisation, and that lots of um, other organisations also have ethics committees. So, for example, Microsoft has an AI ethics committee. Um, and I think you're right. We do need these uh, mechanisms for being able to um, understand how business is going to impact on the the individuals that we're serving or the individuals that are um, being affected by the organisations that we're delivering services to. So I think it's a it is a, a an inflection point in, in time and how we're delivering and, and impacted by technology. Um, I'll hand over to Antonio because I know you've got a question you wanted to ask. 
No, and what we were mentioning that Microsoft has an ethics committee, then you have another organization who has a ethics committee, and sometimes they need to work together. And mm -hmm. then you have you work with a, 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 a government or a, an organization government who has an ethics committee and they have certain norms, how we can somehow find ways that we don't end up in a situation that we are somehow where we need to operate in a world that every in in a more seamless way because everybody end up question oh this doesn't fit in my ethics because i'm uh, an organization based in the united states oh we are an organization based in europe uh, that our ethics and our vision collides and how can we collaborate to deliver a service to a government who has another ethics uh, vision so how we can find a way uh, where we can all collaborate and, and benefit from the society that we are in, because this can go really bad and become really complicated. Uh, and I, I think there's a couple of things that, that I would say, and, and, and in a sense, bear in mind that ethics is part of digital society, but there is, as you know, the separate kind of research that's been done around the ethics kind of piece specifically within the scientific community as well, uh, with, with other colleagues involved. Um, the, the first piece is, I mentioned the UN Sustainability Charter earlier, um, and I think kind of whether it's that or, or other methods whereby there's a degree of commonality of measurement of the programs that organizations are putting in place, uh, ethics or otherwise, uh, in the CSR space, I think that's really important to kind of be able to kind of measure like against like. Indeed, if I can, um, again, reference um, a press release this week uh, in terms of Worldline CSR kind of position, then then that references sustainalytics, I think, in terms of having measures in place across various aspects of CSR. And if you look at that release, then it is referencing things like society and diversity and many other things that we've just talked about. Um, and, and indeed, that's got, therefore, a way of measuring that in the context of the category in which we operate, software and services, then we meet a particular threshold and continue to push for, for a higher one. And I think the thing for Atos and, and, and Worldline together is, uh, and other organizations that are increasingly looking at this space, is we all recognize that actually that's increasingly important in the context of setting the right stance and, and, and that, uh, to go back to Christopher's point, um, a sustainable position for society where um, the technologies that are introduced are understood, are trusted, and are accessible and favorable for the breadth of society. Um, rather than those who happen to have access, uh, as perhaps they've 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 had in the past, or indeed happen to have access because they that 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 community is the one that understands the complexity of that particular area. And as we've talked about before, and as we asked in the survey, there are plenty of areas coming um, that are raising kind of big questions and and are complex to understand. Um, and I think that comes through in in the survey results as well, where we've asked questions around AI or uh, we've asked questions around human augmentation or genomics, et cetera, then, then people are less comfortable because, because it's harder to understand in terms of how it affects them or how it could affect them and what they need to know about it in terms of making the decisions. So I think, yes, kind of different businesses can do different things, but the important thing is that there are global initiatives and global measurements that at least are able to compare um, the progress and the um, positioning that organizations are taking and, and great that Atos and Worldline, to go back to your origin, original question, uh, Deborah, great that kind of there is the sponsorship for looking at these um, issues, whether it be ethics or whether it be the digital society and the influence on us all um, in, in the work that the scientific community does. Uh, can I just chip in with a, a short comment? Um, I, I think that's really important important point that you raised Antonio around um, different geographies um, and how you manage that there's a real challenge with how you tally up a, a physical world where the boundaries between us are so significant in our cultures in our our perceptions and our approaches to things and how we feel and the digital world where um, Physical, physical boundaries are of much less significance. Um, we, no, no more acutely do we see that than in social media, where we now have Facebook having to juggle the, and indeed every other social media organization, juggle the, the ethics in, in one country with the ethics in another and saying what's right and what is wrong. Now at the moment, our governments are saying to these organizations, you need to apply your rules. You need to apply your um, charters and, and those documents. 
rather than saying you need to abide by our systems and uh, the, the conversation seems to be wrong at the moment they seem uh, these these organizations seem to have a, a lot of power to to decide what we talk about over quite sensitive topics um, and on the topic of um, location that our survey results were really interesting in this respect uh, Rob mentioned the hypothesis around um, east versus west um, uh, adopt, uh, approaches to technology and we found uh, across the results that um, Asia was much more positive about embracing technology in particular about digital assistance, about driverless cars, and um, around social media. And the latter one being that people over the age of 40 in Asia felt much more comfortable with social media than people over the age of 40 in America and uh, Europe. Now I have to wonder why is it the context around us. Um, I think it's really significant of how our cultures, our friends and family and what we come across on a day-to-day -day basis changes how we feel. And we need to find a way of recognizing that in, in the work that our organizations do. Okay. So um, I'm going to backpedal a bit because I'm thinking about the, the question that Antonio raised and, and Rob's response, which was that you know, we there are ways of reporting. So one of the things that we use at the moment is the the global reporting index for sustainability, and GRI covers a number of things. And um, and one of them that it's recently started covering, rather than just sort of how sustainable and how green we are, is is reporting against CRPD, the the Convention on Rights for Persons with Disabilities. At the moment, though, that's not one of the core things that, that companies are, are judged on. It's sort of an additional thing. I'm pushing that um, that this becomes something that should be integral to to the reporting. It should be part of uh, you know, a, a, an essential part of of the measurement of, of CSR. Because at the moment, as as the communities have talked about, um, and as Antonio has talked about as well, and Deborah. Um, People often see CSR as smoke and mirrors, and there are lots of different ways of, of measuring what we think it is. The thing about something like G GRI is it's a global reporting index. Um, and whilst these things are by no means perfect, much like standards, because you, you essentially don't always hit the highest common denominator in order to reach a commonality, um, they are still useful. So I, I think we need to encourage um, the adoption of, of, of these tools and then gently keep raising the bar time after time after time, because it's it's through using them that you start to have a voice in the in the way that they are uh, configured and, 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 um, and, and brought forward. And I think if I if I can so if I can add to that, and I, I wanted to share something actually. So um, I had a conversation uh, last week, um, uh, and, and actually the conversation was around uh, some of the accessibility of some of our products and some of our competitors' products, and we had some particular feedback um, in terms of social media in relation to people's experience of using these kind of particular products. Um, and information like that and com combined with the work that obviously um, you all have been doing and kind of really shining a light and bringing focus to the subject and combined with some of the insight from the survey in terms of how people feel about technologies and how do we make sure there's better access to that, I think is changing some of the positioning, not just in terms of what we report on or, or, or the measures that we've got around uh, CSR, but actually changing the focus of the products and the way that we kind of um, design, deliver, uh, them in the market. And, and for me, I mean, great that we've got the piece around and the conversation in terms of the CSR, but more fundamental to that is how do we make sure that the services that we deliver for consumers um, or for businesses are able to be accessed by everybody, are able to give value to everybody, no matter what their position. And I think what I hope in the work that we are all doing is that organizations um, 
such as those that we work for or indeed such as those that we work with um, are better understanding the um, the urgency and the necessity of doing things differently to recognize how again they kind of get this more inclusive society that delivers benefit for all rather than some of the alternatives that we can absolutely all see in terms of whether that's through fiction as we've talked about previously um, or indeed um, as we see around the world. So I don't think there is a simple answer but what I would like to think is that through the work that we are all doing the decisions that the organization is making in recognition of the technology and digital changes is that are taking place at the moment faster than ever before organizations have to respond to that so so following that you know, uh, when you were publishing the, the the results of the of the survey uh, and sharing that with with uh, with other colleagues what Type of feedback we were able to get from them? Were they surprised? Did they ask, "Oh, I know you're doing this. Why were you doing this?" What type of uh, I know uh, engagement and were able to get from from them at, at this level? Do they see this as something that needed to be done, or there was, "Oh, you are just creating a test case here. This might be used." Can you tell us a bit about you know the the whole thing, the whole conversation that happened uh, around the topic after the, the publication? I, I, if I could, um, so I think there were there were two elements of the message. There was there was one that we have a new understanding of what the digital divide means to us. Um, no longer do we feel like it's access to technology necessarily. There is still a problem with access to technology in places around the world, but it, it's 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 more ubiquitous than it was in the past and um, now it's more about um, our emotions towards the technology and, and and whether we feel able to embrace it or not so i think that's one element of the message that starts to hit home uh, with people when we've started to share it with and we've got a lot of positive uh, feedback on that in regard to the surveys and building on that to say well actually this is what it looks like we, we can talk about this stuff, but he, here are the actual lines to say, this is where someone stops feeling comfortable and starts feeling uncomfortable. And what we're hoping is that in specific scenarios where organizations are bringing out specific capabilities, whether that be new ways of uh, enabling online payments or, or new healthcare things or things like that, that um, they can take insight from our sponsors. Now, we're not for a minute saying that this is the end of the conversation. What we're trying to do is build the conversation so the next time um, an organization does something that can be so intrusive in an individual's life, that they take a minute and hopefully much longer than that to consider what impact they might be having and how best to ensure that everybody feels able to embrace something when it's important for them to do so. I think if, if I can add a couple more things, um, and, and again, probably different types of reaction. So I've had a reaction of uh, when we talk about some of the more interesting or, or obscure results that kind of come out of it, um, some people are fascinated by it, um, can continue to quote it, continue to use it because um, it, it, it's, it, it's a grabber of attention in that sense. Why would it be? We can all hypothesize around the why, but we are we are guessing in a sense we didn't ask the why. Um, the other thing is kind of so what why is that relevant to me and i think if i can give an example so we asked a number of questions in terms of um payment or financial related i think there were, there were seven questions in that particular space ranging from uh, do you manage your finances online through to uh, would you pay for goods with a chip embedded into your um in, into your arm for example um and i think actually if you look at the granularity of the data then it gives us some insight as to which countries are have got the greatest comfort with contactless payments, for example, which countries have the least comfort. I think from memory, um, some of the, some of the um, Southeast Asian countries and the UK was kind of very high around comfort with um, contactless payment. Um, I think some countries like um, Germany and the US were less so. But we've got that for each question. So, so if you if somebody came to me today and said, right, well, we've got this kind of new new product that we're kind of thinking of. It's it's, it's pushing boundaries a bit in terms of the way that it works. We're thinking of kind of trialing it in whatever country it was. 
then we, we've got some information and data that suggests um, is that likely to be the most sensible approach? Is that likely to be adopted in a positive way? Or indeed, if we know that it's not, how can we actually kind of put techniques and kind of support in place for that to give it a better chance? And I think when you when you then kind of begin to explain to people and colleagues the value of the data in terms of better being able to land the services that we're trying to provide, not just for ourselves, but for, for our clients' businesses, then people begin to understand. Yeah, I think you know, relating um, technology and the benefits and attitudinal um, considerations to people's day-to-day -day experience of their jobs and, and, and what they're trying to deliver always helps. I think wh when I'm trying to get the message across about accessibility, it's it's always thinking about how I can frame that in the person who I'm speaking to's worldview, because otherwise we're pushing our view of the world on onto them. It's much better that we try and take an empathetical view and um, understand how we can engage them and get them to see that that these are important issues. And we can certainly um, bring those emotive stories to the table because these topics are inherently emotive. Sure. Um, I commonly use the um, example of my grandmother and how she felt um, terrified of online banking and having something on a, an app that she could um, put too many zeros on the end of something or she might get hacked in some way. Whereas I've got it on my phone and I, I use it all the time. I think it's great. Uh, if, uh, Everyone's had a grandmother. Everyone's got a, a family member that might be um, affected by this in some way. And you, you start to get a realization that actually this impacts on me as a, as a member of our society. And that's when it becomes much more compelling. Yeah, I, I think we have to bring it home and bring home the human aspect. Uh, ultimately, uh, regardless of whether the intelligence is artificial or, or human, um, the, the users and the people impacted are ultimately human and, and it is, yeah, we're, we're, we're working, whatever technology we're applying, we're working within the construct of a society and we need to understand the impacts of that and, and help people that are we're working with or that we're serving to understand the impacts of that. So um, what, what next for for this i know we're we're all right busy writing up stuff for our our journey 2022 scientific community publication but um obviously com, you know publications aside i know that this is not the first thing that you've done on this topic and i doubt that it will be the last so what are your plans beyond um beyond the end of this year well i think um, our, our work isn't done in, in many respects. Um, one thing we really want to focus on now is, okay, we've recognized that there is this digital divide and we've got some compelling evidence for it. What should organizations do about it? And be a bit more specific about the fact that um, the, the, the tools and um, ideas that these organizations should, should take into account. And then what we'd really like to do, and um, we're not quite sure how to do this just yet, is to do another survey at the end of 2018, because um, we're, we're, we like the punishment of it. I think it's really important that we get a feeling of how this divide is changing over time. Um, do I acknowledge something that I was um, comfortable with, just like accessing the internet, and does that remain comfortable? And do I start feeling uncomfortable about new things that have come on the horizon? Or actually, maybe with social media, um, the, the environment around us is changing, perceptions are changing, maybe I'll feel less comfortable with that in, in, in five years' time. Um, it's it's going to be fascinating to find out. I think doing this on a, an annual or iterative basis could build some really rich insight. Uh, have, have you considered uh, uh, let's, uh, presenting the results publicly at an event, conference, uh, something like that? Funny you should mention that. Um, so, so there's a number of um, 
sessions that we've been uh, that started or, or indeed uh, uh, the conferences uh, that we're attending. Um, uh, certainly kind of March, April, May, I think we've got about four or five um, events of various films online or, or in person that we are doing a bit of a double act um, and trying to kind of share with as many people as possible some of the insight and also get their input and an understanding as, as to how important and how they recognise that it could be of value to them. Um, so yes, we continue to do that. I think um, also to go back to, 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 to Neil's question as well, and I, I agree with Chris, I think it would be fascinating to do this as an annual survey to understand how kind of uh, people's feelings changed over time, uh, the, which could very well go either way, dependent on what happens over the next kind of few years. Uh, but the other thing, very personal thing, um, uh, it comes back to how do we how do we kind of land this information? How do we translate it for people? Um, and so the other thing that I'll, I, I'm doing is continuing to write more um, and perhaps not uh, uh, maybe more uh, longer articles than, than the blogs that you've seen me write um, but what I'm trying to do with that writing is kind of do the same thing as, as some of the recent in blogs which was to combine um, near future um, near future realizations of how the technology and, and digital services can affect people's lives um, so to bring it to life um, so, um, so that's what I'll be kind of doing, trying to kind of get some of those uh, published over the next kind of year or two um, to try and just um, spread the message even further. Well, good luck with that. I, I always have really great intentions to write stuff. Um, it's one of the, the hardest things to get done, not just because of dyslexia, but just <laughs> starting <laughs> getting started and and, and and actually putting pen to virtual paper i i completely agree although um uh, hopefully i've got one kind of coming in the next few weeks yeah excellent so um thank you it's been another fascinating half hour um we're really looking forward to seeing the uh, conversations on twitter this this coming tuesday need to thank barclays as always for supporting us and you know keeping the lights on and, and helping us with the, the captioning and lots of other things too so um thank you very much it's been great chatting to you christopher and rob thank you for having us absolutely Excellent. thanks thank you very much again and look forward to it